my name is Chris Nichols. I am one of the co-chairs of the Boulder County CRES, so Colorado Renewable Energy Society. And tonight we have one of our speaker series presentations, which we try to do every month. And this one is focused on how affordable family housing and passive house works. And our speaker this evening is Andrew Mitchler. Um, and he, I'll go into a little bit more detail um, as we get into his bio, but he is a certified passive house designer and a partner at Hyperlocal Workshop. So let's go ahead and step into our um, announcements and our agenda for this evening. I'm going to go through a few slides here this evening um, just to introduce you to Cress if you don't know who we are and uh, some of the other things that are um, going on that should be relatively brief. I don't think we'll even go 15 minutes for that. Um, one other thing I did want to mention is we have um, a couple of sponsors specifically for our um, Boulder chapter whom we have relied on over the years. One of them is the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, we've been very blessed in that we, in the past, pre-COVID, we've been able to use their facility and one of their signature um, auditoriums over at the CU Seek Center that's on their East Campus. Um, and that's just been a wonderful place for us to um, be able to have these speaker series events um, and be able to kind of, uh, you know, also showcase some of what that facility is about. It's a pretty cool place. If you don't, if you haven't been there, you sh when COVID stops, you uh, hopefully get a chance to get over there. Um, another uh, individual that I wanted to mention in business is Natural Focus Digital. Um, Ryan Ludlow, he is one of our steering committee members for the Boulder chapter, Boulder chapter, sorry. Um, and he has been for the last year and a half or so, um, and again, pre-COVID, um, been working our video um, while we were in session um, over at CU. What he does for us now is he cleans up the videos that we have and promote um, and put out on our website. So he makes sure the audio sounds great and uh, does things to clean them up for us. So I wanted to send a shout out to both of those folks. Um, obviously, we are very appreciative of their effort and their assistance. Um, next thing, the so if you don't know, um, Cress has been around for, this is our 25th year, um, and uh, we're very happy that we've been able to continue on through COVID. Um, but our goal is to really raise awareness and, and provide these educational opportunities um, to help people understand um, renewable energies and energy efficiencies, techniques and um, options of how to adopt and, um, and make these more prevalent um, in our world. Um, and we, we, there are many different facets to it. One of them is policy as well. Um, and uh, we don't have any updates for you tonight on that, but um, we will try to provide some updates for what's happening at a uh, state level and or local level. Um, if you are interested, um, you can become a member of CRESS. Um, we do have a new platform out there. So if you were a member previously um, and have not renewed, say, in the last six months or so, there is a new, um, there is a new registration um, platform for that. Um, the intro um, is $30 and a regular is $55. I believe there's some, uh, I believe there may be a promotional um, uh, piece to it right now with it being our 25th year. So that might be something to take a look at if you have not been a member before. Um, and what that provides you is access to all of the CRESS events throughout the state. There are five chapters, um, Boulder, Denver, Fort Collins, uh, let's see, Boulder, Denver, Fort Collins, there's Jefferson County, and then there's also um, Colorado Springs or in that regional area. And each one of us put on events, maybe not necessarily every month, um, but we do each support and uh, bring on these speakers to our events. And uh, you would have access to any and all of those. Obviously when COVID is, uh, um, beyond us and in the in the rearview mirror, um, we'll be coming back to live sessions. Um, so it would provide you with that. Um, if you are interested in getting involved in the Boulder chapter, um, the link for 
um, our email is right below there. And the person who manages our volunteers is Steve Whitaker. Okay, um, how can you find us? We're on Meetup, Instagram, Facebook. You can find us on the web. Um, and then there is also our email. Okay, so for upcoming events, um, there is an event coming up that we wanted to make note of. Um, it is on Earth Day, um, and that's via mobility. And uh, there's going to be a discussion with Microgrid Labs. Um, and it's all about electrification of the via mobility um, services that are within our Boulder County community. Um, might be something of interest. Um, if you are interested in that, go ahead and just take a quick snapshot of that. Um, I believe we're going to try to promote that on our um, website. Uh, I could be wrong there, but I certainly wanted to make sure that it was um, mentioned this evening, and that might be a really neat event. And we're hoping to, um, in either May or June, have uh, someone from Microgrid Labs to uh, come and speak at our speaker series events. Um, we also have those events noted here. It'll be May 12th and June 9th. Um, and those are to be determined. And we'll send out a email message to folks who are engaged with us um, to let you know who that will be. And it'll also be up on our, our Meetup page as well as our Facebook page. Okay, um, one of the things we typically try to do is let folks know of opportunities that are out there. Um, I don't have any specifically this evening, but I did wanna make sure that um, for those people that are looking, we have a couple of links. Um, here, and I have checked those to make sure that they are all active. Um, if people want to take a quick shot of that, screenshot of that um, for your purposes and career searches, uh, please do so. If not, you can always reach out to us and we can provide those to you at a later date. Okay, um, I just wanted to do a intro and a bio of Andrew Mitchler. Um, he is a certified passive house designer. Um, He's a partner at Hyperlocal Workshops, which is a passive house design firm based in Masonville, Colorado, and also in San Francisco. He designed and built the first certified intentional passive house in Colorado. He's the co-originator of Passive House Rocky Mountain Group, as well as serving on the board of the North American Passive House Networks and NCRES, which is our sister organization um, up in Fort Collins. Um, he's currently working on Temporal House. It's a multifamily mid-rise timber and straw-based passive house located in Los Angeles. And it's they're working on that for the 2021 ECC Venice Biennial. I probably just butchered that, but hopefully not. Um, <laughs> if you get a chance to take a look at that, um, it's actually really interesting. And, and I think that Andrew may, um, may talk about that a little bit this evening. We make all these presentations live, as I mentioned. Um, so we put those on our Crest, um, Crest Energy org site um, under the video section. Um, if you don't capture the link here, you can always go just to uh, crest-energy.org and look on, up under the video tab. So with this, um, I'm going to uh, introduce Andrew and transfer over and change to you as being the presenter. And then I've got a question for you. Well, we're so pleased to have you here this evening. We wish it could be in person, um, but we will uh, we will do our best in um, doing it through the webinar. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, even before we got started, was um, can you tell me a little bit more about um, Passive House and the Rocky Mountain Group with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I got kind of, I was part of NCREST for a number of years and kind of really enjoyed the nonprofit side of the education advocacy work we can do in Colorado. So after I departed from that, um, there's we we're just budding with Passive House. We gave lots of presentations on Passive House, but we didn't really have much of a kind of a local resource for Passive House. So we started, a few of us started the North America, I'm sorry, the Rocky Mountain Passive House Network, which kind of is from Montana down to New Mexico region. And that's part of the North American Passive House Network, which is uh, which was originally just a group of practitioners around the country who got together and started a nonprofit. And they represent a uh, Passive House Institute and the International Passive House Standard, 
So um, we do lots of trainings. We do pass house training, both for designers, consultants, and then there's a tradespersons training also, and um, lots of other resources, conferences, and uh, we do something like this inspired, of course, by uh, the, um, the NCRES uh, daily events. We started doing a monthly presentation, which now is being done nationally as well. So, wow, so that's can, great. Yeah, it's really been, you know, I can find a lot of roots from, uh, from CRES. So you can, you can look, look up at the website, uh, it's Passive House Rocky Mountains, and go from there. Or you can always look at the North American Passive House Networks website. And I can kind of segue that uh, just in relationship with this presentation, they have this great uh, PDF owner's manual and developer's manual. You can download on the North American Passive House Network.org website as a resource kind of, you know, next step from what we're going to go over tonight. And some of those projects are also on there in their uh, PDFs. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you so much. I am going to now um, transfer over and let you run with your presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, you can always just, I'll, I'll be right here. If there's anything that comes up, um, go ahead and just give me a shout, but I'm going to let you uh, run with it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So here, here's my contact info. If you guys are interested, you can look at the website, uh, hyperlocal.com is uh, where we I have some projects as well. And I, I should also mention just in the Boulder area, I also am co-owner of uh, Soul Coffee, which is a solar powered uh, espresso, mobile espresso truck, just for fun. So um, I know a lot of you are probably pretty familiar with Passive House and you've seen this before, but sometimes it's always good to start with the basics before we kind of get into the, into the gravy, so to speak. And so, um, this is kind of passive house is a very intentional standard, as I uh, or, we was, or we said before, in the sense that we're looking at uh, kind of the, um, the thermal dynamics of buildings and how they work and, and the approaches to save as much energy as possible so that you don't need very much energy to operate the building. And also um, there's a significant uh, uh, improvement in the comfort and the what they call hygiene in Germany, but we just we can just call it the health of the building as well. And there's also a fresh air component to these buildings as well. So they're based on these five basic principles: air tightness, lots of insulation, good windows, uh, good solar gains or protection as needed. And we'll probably go into some of those details, all these details into the projects as well and, and break these down. And then um, the ERV or HRV, the, the uh, heat recovery ventilation system. And that's pretty critical because, of course, we need fresh air in buildings. And with COVID all of a sudden happening, we found out that our buildings really, you know, from code standpoint, really is not very well uh, oriented towards fresh air. And recirculating air has gotten a lot of people sick in buildings. So Passive House is um, right from the beginning has really uh, taken a hard look at uh, fresh air systems. Um, it's a performance-based standard. And we mean that quite literally. I uh, hear that kind of thrown around quite a bit. Um, but we're using, we're, the first thing is like we use components that are tested and verified for their performance, like the uh, HRVs and the ERVs. We do windows and other types of components in the buildings even wall systems. Um, the verify construction uh, details happen in, in the sense that uh, we're, we're verifying the modeling and the construction during construction and even testing it during construction, especially the air tightness uh, component. So that, uh, you know, unlike code, if you get something wrong, you don't just say, yeah, well, maybe we'll get it better next time. Each building has to pass this, uh, this uh, kind of rigorous, rigorous process. Um, then the buildings are well documented uh, for the certification. So there's a, another layer of third party that's verifying all the construction or the pertinent construction details for the, uh, for the energy performance. Blur door testing, of course, we all know um, a lot more about blur door testing and how air tightness is really critical for buildings, especially in Colorado. And then the ventilation system also has to be commissioned and verify, which means that uh, the balanced air system is actually working and providing fresh air at the right place at the right time 
and people won't shut it off because either it makes too much noise or uh, the air is too cold coming into the room, for instance. Um, so this is a little bit different than what we're typically used to, especially in the green building community, which is kind of what we you know, refer to as a checklist approach or a prescriptive approach to building. And in fact, you could almost say that passive house is really not a green building standard, but more of a performance standard that you can build other green components onto. So it's data driven. And what that means is that we're looking at how each individual building is working within, uh, within the thermal dynamic qualities. And this is an interesting slide and breaking down what, when you use code, what you basically do is you, in the prescriptive approach, you just add some more insulation, put in some, some uh, more efficient appliances, and uh, then you say, I'm this much higher than code is. Um, when you start improving it uh, with kind of passive levels, you might get a little bit more airtight. You might put in mechanical ventilation systems. Uh, often, at least the American systems, aren't that energy efficient. So there's a balance between, you know, do we want fresh air or do we want more ventilation? Best of us, we want both, of course. Um, in ASHRAE, often that those are two totally separate standards. So that's not terribly well integrated, which makes it difficult. And then uh, once you get better windows and put all these components together, it still doesn't mean that, the, that it's a high, really high performance building. You actually have to go out and sort of stress test it using energy modeling. And the energy modeling, uh, for example, of this building uh, to the um, right-hand side, show it's just notations on kind of where different issues are in the building uh, as we're as it's being developed uh, within the passive house threshold. And at the end of the day, we're looking at reducing kind of the total energy usage of the building. Uh, for heating and cooling by about 80% from code and overall maybe 60 to 70%. And this is this is the real world. This is these are actual buildings that have been um, verified. Um, kind of part of that quality controls, you know, everybody has to be kind of on the same team at the very beginning of the project. Uh, you're going to be working with a fast house designer or a consultant. Basically it's the same thing, designer consultant. Or, and it's really great to have a tradesperson or somebody who's uh, certified as a tradesperson on the building site to, uh, especially when it comes to the QA uh, of the construction itself. And then there's a certifier. So there's a, there's, that's the third party who's over, who's overlooking the work of the people, people engaged in the project. And then the certifier actually has to uh, send the project over to the Passive House Institute who overlooks their work as well. So there's quite a, quite a few filters in, in the process uh, as far as people's engagement. And this is really the core of the building is having everybody working in, in step with each other and in coordination and especially having one or two individuals who's pretty, who has experience with this before to kind of guide through a lot of these issues. Um, I'll quickly go through this. So I talked about the outcomes is the 80% uh energy savings for the heating and cooling which is quite huge you can imagine in colorado for instance net zero energy um net zero energy right now we use often this term loosely as a kind of an annual you put a lot of solar you make a lot of solar in the summer to make up for all the energy you use in the winter but what, for passive house we're actually looking at something called primary energy renewable which is a balance of energy on a seasonal or monthly basis from uh, consumption to the production of renewables on site. Um, occupant comfort is immersive. These buildings actually feel great. I'm in one now. And um, my God, we have lots of guests. And that's probably the one thing they almost always talk about is how they feel inside the building. Um, it's fantastic. Health is always a big consideration, especially when we're talking about low income housing um, from materials to uh, fresh air. Um, and keeping buildings that are uh, thermally uh, stable as well. Uh, the aggregated cost of these buildings, especially when we talk about low income, can be less, sometimes significantly, once we throw the energy uh, consumption component of the buildings and uh, what people have to pay for electricity uh, for both heating and energy consumption, just generally. And then quality controls, we saw that there's quite a 
quite a bit of steps engaged to make sure that these buildings are built as they're designed and intended to. And finally, the long-term resilience, you know, we're really looking at buildings that are being stress tested way beyond what we understood every year. We're breaking heat records and now we're breaking cold records as well. And uh, we're actually designing passive houses to stress test them out to 2030 to 2040 to 2050 uh, scenarios. So um, some of the tools we use at the beginning is, uh, it's all it goes around what we call the passive house planning package. I, and that's basically this giant uh, hunk of software. Um, we put lots of data sets in. One way to help put the data in has made it a lot easier now is Design PH, which is a SketchUp energy modeling. And I have one open and we can, we have time, we can take a real quick peek at it. And then, uh, then we can jump into building science. And this is specifically around the kind of the multifamily or larger scale projects. I'm going to say maybe about 50% of passive houses around the world are um, larger non single family homes, and the majority of those are multifamily buildings. Um, for a couple of reasons, they were urbanizing the hell out of uh, the built environment now, of course, and so our buildings are naturally getting larger within the cities. And also because the cost effectiveness of passive house once we get to larger scale really uh, comes together uh, quite clearly, evidently. So um, the, the business case for passive house at scale is really taken off. Um, one of the reasons is because the surface to floor area ratio where we really begin is that the energy modeling, the less actual wall, roof, and floor you have to habitable space um, decreases, which means that your actual energy per square foot, and that's how we at the end of the day, analyze passive mass. Your energy intensity per square foot goes down the larger you get, uh, potentially. So that's uh, within the tree to floor area. Another another kind of way to look at it is that um, the form factor of a building can can really change the the um, total energy uh, consumption sometimes quite dramatically, and in the cost area we can take a really basic shape like a rectangle and then we can just slide it make two rectangles if we increase the overall surface area by 10 percent for just say some random project within our energy model we might have to add two inches more insulation to make up for the energy loss from all that extra square footage once we jog out another even small section add it up to 20 um, percent then we can we might have to put even more insulation into the building. So we like to start basically with simple buildings and the feedback. You can certainly play with how much insulation you want to or other factors of the buildings, but it gives you um, really good control on the performance and the cost of adding or taking elements out of the building itself. And so here we are in form factor hell essentially. A lot of modern Contemporary buildings, uh, the style has become uh, quite uh, complex in the way they're being built. Uh, we have a San Francisco project by Studio Gang that's near completion. Um, uh, big in New York made this uh, court scraper, they called it. And they, they like to say how sustainable they are, but this building is form factor is, is miserable, especially in the city of New York. And the city of New York is extremely paranoid about uh, the quality of overglazed, uh, thermal bridging, uh, high, low performing buildings now, because uh, they don't have a lot of energy to work with. Uh, in fact, they're shutting down their nuclear power plant by the end of the year uh, and converting back uh, to natural gas plants again. So uh, it's a big issue. And another Herzog did more project, certainly not low income, but uh, on the um, left, I'm sorry, the right hand side, but you can tell uh, we have thermal bridging, we have a uh, massive form factor issues, all sorts of things that are playing against the performance of the building. When we look at kind of these uh, larger buildings, um, what we're really doing is kind of the basics at the beginning. Uh, we're thermally isolating the building. So here's a good project. I think this one is in New Jersey that just got completed um, that 
we like to put the uh, thermally broken, uh, ins nice clean insulation level on the outside is the best way to do it. Um, these are, for instance, these clips that they're emphasizing here are fiberglass and they, um, they are thermally broken from the inside wall to the outside wall. So that concrete slab, for instance, is not connected to the outside and A, leaking a lot of air and B, getting cold and condensing sometimes inside the wall and uh, absorbing moisture in the long term. It also gives us gives them an opportunity to put their windows in a really ideal space in the wall. Uh, it turns out windows can, can be one of the major factors in either a high performance building or a low performance building, simply not just by the window itself, but how it's installed in the building. And then airtight assemblies become simplified. Um, so on site, we can make these really uh, tight buildings like 0.6 ACH50 compared to code, which is three. Uh, typical mechanical systems, as I mentioned, that we are looking at uh, ventilation as our main system. Um, and there, there's a lot of different factors into determining if you need to heat or cool the building or how you heat and cool the buildings. Um, that depends both on the building design and the climate and the type of equipment you're using. Um, because we have a lot of people inside of these multifamily buildings, we actually have a significant uh, heat source uh, from all the showers and laundry and the cooking and people just uh, living in the buildings. So that's taken account uh, quite quite care carefully in the passive house. So that really lows, lowers the total heating demand for the building. But at the same time, that can actually increase the uh, cooling demand at some times. So, so there's a lot of balance factors that's happening. Uh, heat pumps have certainly, almost all passive houses are pretty much um, all electric at this point. And with uh, these incredibly efficient heat pumps coming out in line, uh, that's really just completely taken over uh, the approach uh, to space conditioning, as well as uh, creating hot water. Uh, even little things like uh, wastewater heat recovery uh, can be quite effective as uh, for the cost going to uh, new uh, multifamily buildings. And then windows. Um, windows, as I said, are a major component of the buildings. Um, and they're really kind of the, the most dynamic interface between the outside and the inside. So we do like to have people have the option of opening and closing a window. In fact, uh, natural ventilation is often used quite extensively uh, for uh, swing season cooling or even sometimes summer cooling in the passive houses. Uh, the first passive house was, in fact, a multifamily. It was um, the passive house Krankenstein, uh, uh, developed by Dr. Wolfgang Feist in uh, Darmstadt, Germany, which is where the Institute is now. And it's four residences. Um, they still own one of the residences. And uh, it was built in 1988, so it's a good 25 years, 26 years old. I'm not good with math, but, but it's been around for a little while. Um, Sure, longer than that, right? And what they did was they wrote this, uh, they came out uh, last year with this great uh, white paper, uh, 25 years of passive house. It's about, a, about, uh, about 150 pages, just basically breaking the building down, uh, looking at the walls and, and the ventilation system, looking at um, the performance through all those years. You can imagine they monitor it, monitored it uh, quite extensively through that time. And they're finding that it's been really consistent as far as its energy consumption. This is quite typical that uh, when passive houses are first uh, built, they, they use a little bit more energy than what they're modeled for. There's a lot, buildings take some time to dry out amazingly. So, so there's a lot of kind of in, embedded energy that needs to get this thing up and running. But over the years, uh, they can be quite stable. And he's looking at their first project is running just a little bit. Uh, the threshold's 15 kb uh, kilowatt hours per square meter per year, and they're at 8.4, so they're below uh, significantly what they set the standard to. Uh, and this project, uh, they had to build their windows. There were, were triple pane windows. They had to build their heat recovery ventilation system, things like that. Uh, but Passive House has grown up, and it's grown up in a really big way. A lot of people kind of assume it's called passive, it's called house. So we get thrown in with the, in the ring of passive solar houses, but uh, 
as I said, at least 50% of the buildings are uh, larger than uh, single families. And quite a bit of them are turning into the mid rise and we're even getting into high rise territory. Um, hot spots around the world are really quite unique. Uh, New York has really taken off um, with the Cornell Residential Tower uh, as, as uh, student housing for a new campus on Roosevelt Island. Uh, that was a pretty well known project, tallest of its time, time, and I think it might still be. Uh, but at the same time, over in Bilbao, another uh, 30 story uh, mid rise, high rise, I don't know what you'd call it, 30 stories, um, uh, multifamily uh, came, got certified um, just afterwards. Um, and then all of a sudden, we're looking at uh, Vancouver, where Passive House really started exploding. Um, in all types of form factors, but most of it's large scale multifamily types of projects. Even Melbourne um, got in, is getting into the fray and you know, winning design in downtown Mel Melbourne turns out to be uh, targeting uh, Passive House. Uh, large firms are taking this on. UN Studios is a massive firm, uh, works worldwide, Perkins and Will. Uh, their Vancouver office is uh, developing the Earth Tower. Handel Architects has really kind of owned it. Uh, as you can tell, they have three projects here. Uh, they, they're basically have their thumbs in lots and lots of uh, large scale passive house projects. Uh, kind of down to earth, something that we're more used to kind of along the front range are these, you know, these um, what they call, you know, uh, three over twos, uh, four over twos, where they have a concrete base and then they'll have a timber frame uh, three, four story building on top of that. Um, uh, you see them, they're quite ubiquitous here, of course. Uh, they're cost effective, they're made out of wood. Um, they're, they're pretty simple as far as uh, code compliance is concerned. You, you don't have to get too crazy with uh, the trades and bringing in lots of specialists. Uh, so, so that turns out to be kind of the story around much of the United States. Um, so, so those have become quite, uh, quite standard in passive house as well. And you find that the form factor is just about perfect uh, when we look at these types of buildings. Uh, we have what we call punch out windows. So that's good. We have, you know, kind of, we're not, our glazing ratios are, are really good for not overheating the buildings in the summertime, not overcooling them in the wintertime. Um, and then we can shade those, shade those windows. We find that quite uh, standard amongst most in all passive houses. It really started, the ball started rolling on this scale of the Bonstadt in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, I happened to get a, get to go on site when they're in the middle of building this. I think there's 6,000 units that are being built in Heidelberg and it's the old train uh, depot that got torn out. So they put this massive uh, passive house mixed use community in there and they're just building one after another after another. Um, basically, they would design one building as a certified passive house and then just repeat the same building or same type of building. Um, I should have had better slides, but there's lots of different ways they're approaching balconies and, and different uh, types of building situations. Uh, that project actually sold out. Um, while they're building fa phase one, phase two sold out. So they uh, had to just build way ahead of what they were planning to originally. Um, I'll go into a couple of specific projects, um, projects I have a little bit more personal information about, or I've been uh, watched, uh, done some more research on uh, specifics. Um, Cornerstone Architecture is is a uh, practice, is a firm, mid-sized firm out in Vancouver, and they're really the first ones to start getting passive houses in the ground just a few years ago. Vancouver has been instrumental in uh, developing passive house as far as code compliance, helping um, helping code uh, as far as incentivizing high performance buildings, specifically certified passive houses, uh, because uh, they want to be the greenest city in the world. And they also have done a lot of trainings within their staff and they have a lot of resources kind of around the communities in general with Canada Passive House within the trainings. So they really understood what it was in how it worked, so they had a full ecosystem. Um, so Cornerstone was able to um, 
get the developer uh, to get two more floors for their project in Vancouver being maybe the third most expensive market in the world, just getting two more floors on the site basically pays for itself immediately. Um, the other thing was that uh, they're able to get some grants, not huge grants, I think $250,000. Uh, they're telling me as uh, Scott Kennedy is the principal with, uh, with Cornerstone is telling me that they're able to get a little bit of grants, but mostly they're able to just really trim the fat and get a standard building practices with the, with the passive house building process. And as you can see these wall sections, we're looking at really a two by six exterior structural wall and then a two by four interior wall, which is where our mechanical chase is. And they decided just to put a hunk of EPS foam, it looks like, in between that. And they taped the foam and that's their tightness barrier. So this is like literally a building you can go to the Home Depot or Lowe's, fill your cart out, um, take it back home and build yourself a house. house. Nothing, nothing crazy, nothing exotic. Probably the only really exotic things is the um, HRV system or the ERV system in this project and the windows, which are high performance. Um, and amazingly, they can do electrical baseboard heating and they don't need cooling for this project uh, because the windows is set open. So they can do night flushing, especially with their uh, ventilation system is also sufficient to do automatic night flushing if people are not opening and closing their windows. So they really, really were able to clean, strip down the mechanical systems. Uh, and we'll find that to be a, a common theme on the cost effectiveness for passive house. So you're basically, you're putting the investment into the envelope rather than into the mechanical systems. Envelopes don't need energy, mechanical systems do, even if they're high performance, even if you have solar panels on your roof. So uh, it's a kind of different framework than some of the net zero buildings that we see that are kind of a code plus with a, a whole bunch of solar panels to kind of make up for it. But of course, solar panels don't work at night, right? So you need that power or to save that power in some fashion. We I mean, look at the carbon impact. Um, another amazing project, uh, this is a development uh, in England. They, a lot of the city councils developed their own low-income housing. Um, so in Norwich, England, uh, they, they developed this I think is 106 units or something like that. Um, and as you can tell uh, what they're able to do because it was a green, not a green field, but it was a brown field site, they're able to develop. So it has really good orientation to the South. And with that, with that kind of idealized orientation, they could really, really lower the amount of total insulation they needed for the building by carefully uh, developing the windows situation. And uh, in fact, I remember the consultant, uh, Sally Good Goodler, I'm going to mispronounce her name, uh, but she was talking about how um, they had a lot of conversations with the architects about the windows. <laughs> and the architects wanted really big windows and they, and you know, that's, that really adds a lot of complication when it comes to the heating and cooling component side of the building. So they are able to, uh, negotiate smaller windows. They're able to get in these uh, good solar shading on top for the summertime. In the wintertime, um, they almost need no extra heating whatsoever uh, with the passive solar. Uh, England's, of course, not known for its passive solar capacity in the winter, but you can definitely take advantage of some of it. And uh, they turned out to win uh, the uh, Sterling Prize, which is basically the highest ar architectural prize you can get uh, through the Royal uh, Architecture Institute in England. So this got the nod, it beat all the sexy uh, projects that had uh, all those uh, really uh, crazy, uh, you know, sophisticated uh, curtain wall systems and, and steel beams and all these other kind of complex components than what we think is good architecture nowadays. These guys did it. They won the architecture prize with simple uh, housing for low income. I'm going to give a shout out and an honorable mention to, um, to the folks over at Onion Flats and, and Tim McDonald. Um, you may have heard him before in, in their group. They're based in Philadelphia and they've been really kind of their, their design build firm and they've been 
they have just a little corner of Philadelphia. They have a few lots right next to each other. They've been building multifamily projects over the years on those lots. Uh, they built one of the very, very first multifamily projects. Um, God, when was it? Maybe 2012 was when it got certified. Uh, apparently, uh, Wolfgang Feist, Dr. Feist, uh, it's one of his favorite projects. And so um, they've they've been evolving from that uh, quite quite a bit. Um, and they've also been really strong in Pennsylvania in advocating passive house as the standard for low income housing uh, because of the kind of these kind of attributes they were bringing along with it. That's that's beyond just kind of the cost effectiveness of it, uh, but certainly the fuel poverty issues, uh, the overall sustainability and the carbon footprints of the buildings, um, the, the, the durability of the buildings and longevity of the buildings, especially during inclement weather or power outages, other things like that, stress on the grid. So they've been really able to make the business case for passive house. Um, I'm saying honorable mention here because this is not a certified nor will it be ever certifiable project. Uh, um, they, they put in uh, to double pane windows uh, they really they built this below market rate. Uh, what Tim says, uh, it's definitely below market rate by maybe five or six percent, um, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, this, so they played every trick they could in the book. Uh, one of those was again going back to the mechanical systems, and they did what is called kind of this magic box theory, is where you can put one box into each apartment. And it takes care of the fresh air. It takes care of the space conditioning, uh, all within the same, all within the same box essentially. So uh, there's no there's no mechanical systems that's that's taking up other closets within the buildings or or the complex layouts, things like that. Um, uh, their water heaters, they also he was also extremely diligent, and careful with, on uh, making sure that they could get just regular heat water heat pump water heaters in the right place to minimize the lines run. So, um, so when they put these solar panels on the building, they can really look at uh, genuine kind of real net zero buildings and potentially net positive buildings in Philadelphia. Um, a lot of people ask, what about the existing buildings? The greenest building is the existing building. You know, that's kind of not true, is it? You know, even for an energy intensive building um, is going still takes so much resources, takes so much um, so much uh, so many other concerns when it comes to health, uh, longevity. Um, you know, we got hit by this nasty cold front, and we are looking at apartment building owners in Denver asking their residents to lower the thermostats because they could not afford the heating bills. Um, that's you know that's that's most of our building stock is essentially in that situation. A lot of these buildings, especially in New York, they're really worried about buildings overheating, especially in the summer if the power goes out. Uh, these buildings are unlivable within hours. So we really need to understand what a good retrofit process, a deep retrofit process, is with this. Um, this project, which is in Windsor, Ontario, uh, again it's a low income. Housing by the Windsor Essex Community Housing Corporation. I'll read this explanation by Andrew Peel. The owner of Windsor Essex Community Housing Corporation spends incredible half of its operating budget on energy, much of which is consumed by electricity providing space heating. You can space social housing organization, CHC per, sees providing affordability and occupant comfort as a key factors in its decision making process. So it looks for ways to reducing the occupant's energy costs. And so when they looked at this 60s building, they really needed to do a deep energy retrofit. Um, an amazing story, and if you look at the section here, um, they simply just put insulation on the outside of the brick veneer, um, and then they had a vapor control component and the brick veneers within the, the, the vapor condensating space. So it's not going to, start swelling up or having issues uh, with with uh, moisture over time. Um, and they didn't really need that much extra exterior insulation uh, to make this project uh, passive house certifiable, do the inner fit 
which is the uh, retrofit standard, which is a stepped process. So you don't have to do it all at once, you make a plan and the certification is through implementing those steps over time uh, because of uh, the cost impact involved. And one of the interesting things they found out was that they had they had to heat and cool this building. Of course, they had to get away from the electric baseboard. It just simply wasn't uh, viable. Um, or I should say that the cooling side uh, made it really complex with a heat pump or variable refrigerant system that would have to be uh, put into each building and with the condensers for each apartment and then condensers on, uh, on the exterior. Uh, turned out to cost triple what the retrofit budget was. So what they did was uh, they took the old windows, they took where the old window shakers and they put in passive house windows. And then in summertime, they can open the windows and install a modern heat pump uh, single package unit uh, for the cooling demand. Uh, so they can cool and dehumidify in the, sun, in the winter, in the summertime. And then they just simply take them out again in the winter, close the windows and you have yourself a uh, winter approved passive house envelope. Because uh, you can imagine Ontario gets awfully cold. So, um, so that's a, one of the interesting tricks they were playing on the retrofit uh, process on developing the, the way to make this an affordable passive house project. So costs. Um, costs are almost impossible to talk about uh, because of the different market rates. So it's almost impossible to compare projects across, of course, different countries, but especially regions, as we know, the United States, you can imagine Kansas can be half the cost of Denver, which can be a third of the cost of San Francisco or New York. So, um, so, it's, so what we need is a lot of passive houses in one place. And the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, uh, as we talked about, Onion Flats um, was helped pivotal in developing uh, their point system, where they you get uh, you get ten more points in your bidding process for low income housing uh, if you do it as a certified passive house, and that really got a lot more people invested in getting actual passive houses uh, into into the uh, bidding process. And they got quite a few of them uh, through as a result as well. And what they found was that um, on average, that uh, the passive houses were about 5.8% more uh, in the first year of the bidding process um, than, the, than, the, than the average. Then it came down to 1.6% um, on the second year uh, when people were uh, doing our RFPs. By the third year, it became three percent or so less on average for a certified pass house than average construction for low income housing. And a lot of that had to do with was people becoming more comfortable with the pass house process uh, experience uh, with how the teams inside the architecture and engineering firms and sort of this uh, this certified consultants working together, the builders uh, felt less um, less worried about kind of these new uh, techniques and were uh, not overbidding things that they perhaps didn't understand. And of course, they were able to kind of hone in their design skills as well, uh, reducing the complexity of mechanical systems, reducing the complexity of the envelopes, things like that. So um, we have, we, you know, once we put a little bit of incentive, just a little bit of, you know, grease in the gears, passive house, uh, at least on the multifamily, uh, low income side really, really is incredibly competitive once you get uh, all those components put together as Pennsylvania has shown. Um, and I think most of that really has to do with the quality and experience of the people involved in the projects and the availability of materials, especially passive house components in the United States um, has really helped that market change dramatically in the last five years. Um, and kind of quickly on my own, yeah, we have a little bit of time. Um, I'm going to quickly go through a project that I've been working on for the last two years or so, as um, this is just a proposal I was developing for the European Cultural Center, which has their upcoming Venice Biennale in May, which I'm participating in. So um, 
I was developing this project uh, for kind of this global this global conversation on what is happening in architecture, what's important in architecture. And I really want to really take a deep dive into kind of the near zero carbon building and uh, as one of the aspects of what we're looking at. And of course, it's going to be Bassett um, And in Los Angeles, you can imagine it gets hot there. So I found a lot which was particularly difficult on Wilshire Drive, which is facing west, which is the most difficult place to place a bunch of windows because that's in the summer, winter, during the shoulder seasons, all the time, you're getting that setting sun. So um, what, what do you do to provide lots of ample glass for people to, to get views and fresh air and things like that, but not overheat the building? So um, the basic program was, uh, was for uh, about 35 units or so for mixed in, uh, not mixed income is basically ref for climate refugees, it's the proposal. And we have a mixed use uh, spaces as well. Um, and space for families or individuals or couples within the building. So it can kind of dynamically change for based on uh, the, the needs of uh, housing. And the lower floor is, is basically a, as I mentioned before, I own this uh, Soul Coffee uh, Espresso Bar. So that was the impetus of developing uh, the idea of putting in a 24-7-365 a, a, uh, 24, 24 7, 365, uh, park for uh, food trucks that constantly change. Um, the project itself, I've been working with the Passivas Institute in developing the energy modeling. And what we're looking at is uh, something called the Passivas Premium for this project which is an energy positive project through our energy modeling system. And the energy pro positive process basically has to be energy positive during uh, the winter season or during the least uh, solar capacity or on-site renewable capacity. And the way they treat that, especially in the multi or these larger buildings is they look at your footprint or your energy capacity on the site for your renewable energy uh, capacity and and balance that out with your energy savings. Um, for the energy modeling, uh, we turned out not to have to have any heating within the building at all, which was really great. So again, looking at how I can simplify the mechanical systems. Um, turns out uh, these are different uh, graphs. It's I know it's super tiny on your screens, so you have to just bear with me. Uh, I was able to sneak it right into the premium, which is that center graph, uh, the, by, uh, by balancing the energy savings with the energy production on the building. And the, and the graph uh, kind of coordinates those two together to put together a, which point in the certification scale you are. And it was fun to play with the PV arrays because I put a massive um, PV array that's uh, horizontal facing south and that basically provides the majority of the winter energy uh, uh, so so it's energy neutral in the winter time and quite energy positive in the summertime with a solar canopy on the top of the roof uh, our cooling load is um is what they is about uh, two-thirds of the passive house threshold of uh in this case 17 kb2s uh one per year per square meter because we're doing i'm working with the institute we're doing this in meters so we're able to um to really lower that pretty substantially where we can actually provide the cooling through our mechanical system for our ventilation system so uh, each floor has its own ventilation uh, energy recovery ventilation system which will have a small uh, cooling coil in it on demand for cooling each floor um, we'll be using the hot water heaters, which are um, cooling units essentially as well. We're taking the waste heat from the interior of the building and heating water with it, which cools the corridors of the building down again. And then uh, it turns out that the wastewater heat recovery is what was able to get me from this uh, Passive House Plus or energy neutral side of uh, the Passive House certification to the P to the Passive House Premium or energy positive was through waste heat reclamation 
uh, that little trick was amazing to play with. So it's really fun energy model these buildings. On the um, building side, and not to say what I did was I um, basically did a 3D model of the building and handed it over to the institute, and uh, they did the actual uh, they did the actual inputs within their energy model. It can be quite complex when you're looking at these larger buildings as far as the mechanical systems and mixed use types of processes. So they get individually um, individually modeled and then put together into a larger model. It's kind of a little bit over my head at the, in the time being, but I'm really surprised at how well it went uh, being able to coordinate with them on one of these larger projects. I'm used to mostly doing residential projects. On the carbon material side, Looking at a good friend of mine developed something called the Eco Cocoon Straw Panel, which is literally a, it's a certified pesticide component, and it's a timber straw insulated uh, component. So you these these are panels that come in specific heights and different types of widths, and then cornices. So you can in corner pieces uh, they're developed for earthquake resistance and uh, open vapor profiles, especially in these warmer climates. So um, I did a podium with uh, nail laminated uh, timber uh, NLT floor slabs and nail cross laminated timber. Um, I'm sorry, floor slabs are, yeah, one of the floor slabs and the walls are made from uh, nail laminate cross -laminate, laminated timbers. And I'm uh, partnered with a company called Lingo Lock or Beck is the, is the, sister, is the main company who developed the wooden nails and uh, they, Turned out to be a great sponsor of the Biennale, and they're able to develop these large mass timber panels that are glue-free, which is and steel-free. So um, we're looking at really. A, a, I'm still doing the calculations. We still have a little bit more work to do, but I'm really, really pleased to see and excited to see how low in the carbon and material side we can get this building as well. So once we mix the energy side and the material side together and then the program, we're looking at, you know, hypothetically, we can be developing these multifamily buildings with turnkey components that we can get now on the market um, at maybe zero extra cost uh, beyond what market rate is for, um, for uh, residential buildings. So to be determined what the real ongoing operational energy is, uh, I'll be working on that in the next couple of months by getting those numbers uh, developed and um, and certified through the institute, um, so that's the end of the, this particular presentation. And um, happy to take on questions. I don't know if we have to make questions going on. Sometimes we get lots of questions about everything, so don't be afraid if it's too technical or too general. Love to go over all sorts of different components on on this topic. Yes, this is Chris. Andrew, thank you for that presentation. That was wonderful. Um, we do have some questions out there. Um, I'm going to start with the first ones that came in. And <clears throat> this is from Martin. And he said, Andrew, you mentioned on your Twitter feed that people with geothermal heat pumps had complaints about higher than expected energy costs. Can you? Yeah. Conf and there's two parts to that. Um, can you confirm that the newer heat pump motors are much more efficient or is that not the case? Well, yeah, I think um, there hasn't been enough research, but in Colorado, um, kind of, and this is what I was learning in Crest, was that um, we were pushing ground source heat pumps quite a bit in the early days. And it was and free energy from the ground was the idea. Um, but at least on the residential side, heat pumps, um, because the energy load for the buildings were, as we said, kind of a code plus level. So we're talking about, you know, we need 60, 70,000, 100,000 BTUs for heating uh, that these buildings would need. And especially if you start heating water with it, that when you run these glycol loops, it could take quite a bit of, bit of uh, pump energy to, uh, to run the glycol through those loops to the point where you actually could potentially be using more heat or more energy just to run the glycol and running the heat pumps than you would with maybe more conventional systems or even gas. So um, there hasn't been that enough real research 
on where we're at with that. But that's it's kind of cool because uh, we're doing we're working on I'm actually I do do that much consulting, but I'm consulting with a friend on who's who's developing his own passive house in Denver, and we're on a very restricted lot. Uh, we're going we're right on the edge of certification because we have we're really just trying to make this thing viable given the the, the extreme constraints of the site and uh one of the proposals is to put in a really tiny uh, 200 foot well with a heat pump um, and a and a three quarter ton unit and um, our issue with passive house is we need really tiny heat pumps and because once you get larger with the heat pumps when they're really not running at full blast they become much less efficient especially with the mini splits so we're interested in kind of learning between the new mini splits the mitsubishis which have a 30 sear air source heat pumps 33 sear for seven eight thousand btus for heating which is plenty i need just one of those to heat this denver house they're 1500 bucks um and how does that going to compare with uh, uh one well and a ground source heat pump so it's still out in the air especially for the larger systems if you don't have a balanced system if you're constantly just extracting heat but you're not putting heat back in the ground potentially you could excuse me start withdrawing so much it's a heat bank basically and basically solar right because it's the sun that's heating the ground that you're storing and using in the winter time that you could potentially uh lose efficiencies from that as well. So we want smaller heat pumps. Ground source are great if they're right sized and the demand is is right sized for the, for the building. Um, commercial, mostly ground source heat pumps are definitely the go-to, especially in urban areas. Great, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, next question came from Frank um, and his is, does passive house design have any applications for tiny home solutions for the homeless community? I'm envisioning a hub spoke design with common elements at a hub and individual units radially connected. Yeah, so so it depends on where you're building it, right? Um, place in Denver, it can be a little more difficult and that's because we saw in the early slides because of that form factor situation. But um, especially with the with the housing guys, uh, we can still you know people people have done the smallest pass house that I know that's certified. We we're just talking about certified, and you know going through all all kind of all all the parts of it is about 110 square feet, and that's in France. Um, I do know some folks who develop their own uh, mobile kind of tiny house. Uh, project and but that's based in the Bay Area. Uh, if we're talking about a place in Denver, um, we, what we really need is health, I think is the biggest concern. So using a passive house component, like a small Zender uh, uh, ERV, and then a little teeny, you know, your occupants going to be in a small enough space, your occupants going to probably be enough heating load that you can put just a small uh, electrical baseboard in there or you can put in a tiny heat pump. It gets a little more complicated in that sense. Um, but at the end of the day, this is why we like to build apartment buildings. Homeless people, like we really should be sticking buildings together and sharing walls. At the end of the day, I really do think that that is the most cost-effective long-term generational solution rather than kind of building cheap buildings and then sprinkling them around in backyards or on lots if it might last maybe 10 years but once once you get kind of condensation issues or other issues within the building itself they might actually end up being unhealthy especially if mold starts growing inside of them so so in that case i think the building science really is kind of the primary concern even before the energy side of it uh, when we talk about tiny houses for instance but it is i don't think certified is possible in denver but uh, definitely the building science part that we learned from Passive House is 100% applicable for the tiny house side of it. I think it would be fun to model something like that. Probably 
take just a few hours to see what it really does. Yeah, that's neat. Is that, um, you mentioned the modeling, is that typically is, that's a software that you use in the development of doing that. Are there, are there applications that the, say if this gentleman wanted to go and take a look at, you know, what the possibility is for doing something like this, are there applications out there where um, he could get a sense of that? Uh, I, the modeling, you know, it takes a, I, I would say don't do the PHPP. Um, that's a little just too much. But um, the, when we're looking at the design, if, you, if you're familiar with SketchUp, the design PH, if you look up designph.org, I think, uh, that plugin, I'm, I'm always thinking that that should be a standard code compliant model. I've, I've done quite a few and I've done a number in Denver recently, and it's ridiculously easy to, it's faster than like ResCheck, to be honest to put in a passive house model through SketchUp and understand what the real dynamics are for each individual building because it's it's site-based, it's oriented, it shows your real heat gains and your real heat losses per individual building and per the way you put the building together compared to something like a res check, which is more of a general kind of confirmation software. Um, and as far as verification, I think it's really easy for somebody to go in and change change up how the building is oriented, how big it is, the different types, kind of components where you put your windows, things like that, to see how much heat energy you need in the winter time. Doesn't work great for cooling yet, but uh, I believe their next version is going to have a cooling component to it. Oh, that's great. Okay, so if I'm going to move. Contact me about that. Sure. Yeah. Yep. And your contact info is uh, is still showing here. So that's great. Um, next question came from William. Um, what if there is construction in the area after PG completion that adds shading to the building? And the second portion to that is when can a builder rely on no additional shading after PH building is completed? So uh, the first part is, yeah, like for instance, this Denver project is on, it's near downtown, but it's on a whole block that's been scraped. I don't know, maybe there's a warehouse there or something um, on Stout Street. And uh, so now I had to actually model in all the shading of the um, buildings to be built in the future. And so I actually had to take the blueprints from the house next to it, which will be built in three years, uh, and put that into the energy model. Because, man, if that house wasn't there, we would have passed the certification with flying colors. But now we're right on the edge uh, simply because of the shading factor. So, yes, we definitely want to model with the future involved. And then, and can you repeat the second part? Yes. Once the building is already built. Yeah. When when can a builder rely on no additional shading after the building is completed? So do you ever have like line of sight, you know, restrictions on what's being built around? I'm not quite sure. What do you think that question is? I'm trying to. I think it's related to, um, you know, the, the first part is. Let's see. Let me get back to it here. Yeah, I, I guess it's are there are there ever any coding, um, you know, city coding um, codes put in play when you're doing a pH home so that uh, one of the structures around or surrounding that home will not shade it and thus cause you no longer to, um, no longer to be a passive home. Yeah, and I think this is kind of the. Um... And that's such, you know, it's so every city, every place has its own rules and its own idea of what, what, um, and I think the solar, I'm sorry, the solar electric panel, you know, the right, right to sky uh, is the same issue. And in fact, I think that probably drives this. Uh, I know Boulder does have some code, right to sky code um, scenarios. Um, I'll say Tokyo, for instance, or Japan. Tokyo specifically has 
a very sophisticated calculation. Actually, it's not that sophisticated. It's just a sky calculation where everybody has a right to sky to certain percentage of their building having solar exposure. Um, but you know, you really have to design for worst case scenarios. You know, and I'm showing this slide because if you look at all these buildings, um, at least on the multifamily, we're really trying not because we have so much internal heat gains in the buildings, and it's true for commercial buildings, all large buildings, we've become a primarily cooling situation for the mechanical systems of these buildings. So if you look at all these buildings, they all have aggressive shading. And shading can be either other buildings, it can be the orientation of the, of the building, it can be um, all sorts of different approaches, but that control of that solar is really key uh, for the multifamilies to work. Residential becomes a lot more tricky. Um, in our case, we for this small Denver project, the southwest side or southeast side is facing the street. So I know that that will never get shaded except for, for the trees. Uh, so, so we understand how that's going to work. But pretty much, you know, we, we just throw in more insulation in those cases and maybe not be overly dependent on thermal solar gains. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think that I think that addressed the question there. Uh, the okay. next one comes from Patty. Um, you mentioned the electric uh, water heaters um, being hybrid, and can you explain um, more so the meaning hybrid um, and how those function? Yeah, uh, hybrid. I I agree with you. I think hybrid is kind of a whack term. Um, it, I don't think it's that meaningful. It's basically heat pump water heater. And the hybrid part might refer to resistance backup for it. In, in I called it hybrid, but it's really a heat pump hot water heater. I was just grabbing the Rheem website and they're labeling theirs as hybrid. Um, so I think that may be more of a marketing term than what they really are. So they're basically, you know, heat pumps, refrigerators essentially. Um, and uh, you can actually duct these as well now. Uh, they come in with a UEF of 4.0, so you so they become extremely energy efficient. Basically, you put one unit of heat of energy in, you get four units of energy out, hypothetically, out of these new units. Um, but yeah, they've been around for a while, but uh, they're finally kind of really getting onto their own. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, next question comes in. What's your take on prefab passive homes like the ones offered on Phoenix House in Grand, in Grand Junction? So that's a panel system. And um, I think the industry is rapidly moving towards panelization uh, for a couple of reasons. We are doing a passive house in Colorado Springs, and we're using a company called Collective Carpentry, which is up in Van or up in British Columbia. They happen to be the best priced and the most customizable. Um, Phoenix House has a certified component. Uh, another company called Be Public, uh, down in in um, Santa Fe, Albuquerque area, is in collaboration with Collective Carpentry. I think most of our projects going forward are going to be um, based on um, fabricated panels developed offsite. Um, a couple of reasons for that is A, uh, labor has gotten really expensive. Um, B, we want controllability of that envelope. So the air tightness factor, the quality of the insulation, all those things, it'd be really great to have that done in a factory environment. And when Collective comes on site, puts the panels together, they know how they go together in an airtight fashion so that we can go right behind them and do our first initial lower door test and not have a bunch of hidden things. And um, especially in the mountains or other regions where it's hard to get uh, labor, uh, especially skilled labor for this level, um, it controls costs when we're building the projects. We certainly have lost projects once the contractor comes in. He says, I don't know what I'm looking at, so I'm going to charge you a third more. And, at the, and also the speed of the projects is very appealing to people to have a building where you have that podium or you have that foundation you can come in in three, four, five days within a week 
you have a dried in space. So um, in the winter time it's great, in kind of wet seasons, it's really quite helpful. You can actually, once you get some, once you cover the windows up in some way, uh, you can actually heat the space and have a heated work environment and start drying out the building even before you have any facade materials in. So I think uh, components are pretty much the, the future. You're going to see at least 50% of the passive houses being built in this fashion, I think, in the next five to 10 years. Great. Um, you know, one of the things one of the uh, one of the participants mentioned was um, in a in a passive home, the walls and the windows are great sound protection, right? I mean, so in a in an environment where it's a multi-unit complex, your um, the sound absorption is probably much greater than in a typical um, typical construction. Yeah. In fact, New York City. The reason why uh, passive house is really taking off in New York City is because of the sound. That's probably 70% of the reason why people decided to develop their projects as passive house. And uh, I was just talking with a landscape architect who was saying her friends in New York, either they talk about real estate, they talk about food, or they talk about how noisy it is. So, so sound, you know, if you can create soundproof walls within the spaces, soundproof floors, your windows and your, and your exterior walls are great. And it's, it, really 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 disturbs me to see these projects built on like the on i-25 in denver these big multi-families are going together they put this these cheap double pane windows in these code these code walls these very thin thinly insulated walls right on the freeway they probably don't have a filtration system for fresh air so these people are immediately not only in energy poverty they're in health poverty they're constantly breathing bad air and they're they're inundated by sounds so that's why i was really interested in dealing with los angeles and the los angeles situation around developing low-income high 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 quality housing and using passive house methodology so sounds huge so i can go on and on but <laughs> for great thank you thanks for addressing that um next question from merrick um, many of these buildings seem to be custom voluntary designs which if any regions or locations are adopting mandatory standards or building codes closest to the passive house standards so it's mandatory in in lots of places in europe first off it's mandatory the city of exeter um, in england um, they early on there when the pioneers for passive house Every building that's going to be built by the city has to be a certified passive house. They build, now they've actually developed land that they've owned and they, they instructed that any developer for these uh, housing developments have to build it to the passive house standard. Um, there's something called the Brussels effect. And that's about 15 years ago, the city of Brussels, just kind of on a whim, and they admit this, they didn't know what the hell it was, said all city buildings need to be passive house. And, it went in up in an uproar. The developers lost their shit. And they worked really hard to, to get Brussels not to do that. But Brussels did build a bunch of city buildings in Passive House. The buildings started coming in below cost from code. It cost the city was saving so much money on uh, their energy bills that they basically made Passive House for certain size buildings code. Um, the city of New York is basically going to say that once you, if you build a building that's over 50,000 square feet by the year 2025 or 2030, I can't remember, it's going to be passive house levels of energy consumption. Um, so code is it. The volunteer stuff, it's fun for people like me who can have, I can have inspired clients. Typically, they don't have a lot of money, but uh, they're inspired and we can do every trick in the book to make these passive houses ha happen but on scale has to be um, developed as code, either as a reach code or as uh, kind of that stick or um, stick or carrot opportunity. Uh, we our project down in Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs will give me $350 if I certify as a passive house. That's not going to cut it, right? Um, yeah. And using something like 
uh, the energy modeling, as I showed you, that design pH, we can quickly show how quickly these projects can be verified for code officials. And I'd love to be, you know, we, we consulted with the city of Denver uh, quite a bit on Passive House. And then their first question was on our presentation with putting Passive House within the, the new green building reach code was, wait, I thought Passive House was only for houses. I didn't know you could do multifamily. So we, we have a, a long ways to go, at least locally for co-development, but other regions it has really caught, caught up pretty quickly. The Vancouver case, New York case are stand out and Pennsylvania, so. Yeah, there, um, you know, kind of stepping back, there was a, there were more of a comment um, th from KK. I'm not going to uh, attempt to, say your last name because I'll probably butcher it here. Um, he's a professor who has, he's a law professor who studied the issues of shading. Um, and he said, there's very few protections um, against that, kind of going back to what we had spoken about earlier. And he said, there's very, you know, it, he said Boulder and Ashland, call, or Ashland, Oregon, um, have okay. some protections. Um, and I believe California has some rules about vegetation shading, but just for others that may have had, you know, kind of additional um, questions out there. There really aren't, it doesn't sound like there are many um, protections for that in, in yeah. many communities. And that's why we really don't want to be like passive. Like in urban situations, we really shouldn't be overly dependent on kind of these traditional earthship style houses. We really need to be thinking about, you know, the energy conservation first. The sun is free energy. We know it, we love it. But like a net zero building really shouldn't be based on site energy production primarily. Like we shouldn't, we, I'd rather have a tree than a solar panel personally in my neighborhood. And um, there's all sorts of benefits. I can put my solar panel, you know, on the hillside or in a solar garden. So um, so it's not necessarily a negative thing either, the, this, this idea of, of uh, solar solar capacity outside of natural light. Natural light is something that we directly uh, engage with, um, of course, and improves our quality of life. So that's it's a different conversation, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and I have to correct myself there. I did not realize uh, KK is a woman, um, and I think I referred to her as a he. Um, I do apologize for that. Um, I am going to move on to the next question. Um, this one's kind of a broad stroke. It asks how much gas is used in a whole project. And I think that's probably dependent upon the size of a facility um, and the amount of, say, gas appliances versus electric appliances you may have in one. So I don't know anybody who's putting gas into a passive house anymore. That's pretty much gone. Um, Part of it is um, when we talk about the cost part, um, when you're putting gas into a building, uh, those meters can add up pretty damn quickly. The infrastructure for gas can be extremely expensive. Add on, you know, a good, good five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars per unit sometimes. Um, so there's the infrastructure side. There's the incentive side. So there's a lot of incentives now. So the city of Colorado Springs is going to give our clients. $2,000 for being all electric house, which is great. And I think I, I just found that out just uh, last week. I'm sure that's going to be pretty. I think, um, I think we lost you again, Andrew. Um, we're going to hold on for a quick moment here and hope that the uh, audio video comes back in from your connection there. You know, one of the things I wanted to mention in here when I, when um and and i wanted to kind of um speak to this because it was interesting to me when um andrew was talking about the um, essex home and they added in that project they added exterior insulation and i don't know if you were able to see this in the slide in the uh small um diagrams and, and of measurements that he had in there but the exterior insulation was only 100 millimeters thick. And I don't know how many of you are skiers um, out there, but the skis I ski on are wider than 100 millimeters thick. 
And so it's an incredibly small amount that they actually added in that project, which I was really surprised by. Um, and it, it just caught me as an unusual, uh, unusual um, bit of information in regard to the limited amount of insulation that needed to be added to that um, particular project. Andrew, are you back? I am. Our power. Act, I live off grid, and our power went out. <laughs> well, we, we're glad we were able to hold on for you. I, I was. Um, I don't know how much of that you caught, but um, I was uh, speaking about the Essex CHC project, and when you showed some of the dimensions on that, I, I was incredibly surprised by the minimal amount of exterior insulation. Oops, I think we're losing you again. Are you back? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. So I think this is a great example of uh, li living on solar. Our batteries ran out of juice just in the middle of the presentation. So <laughs> Quite all right. I'm glad you're back. Um, so I was referring to the Essex CHC project and the amount of insulation that um, was put on the outside of it. And when I looked at the diagram that you had up there, it was only 100 millimeters of additional insulation on the outside, which is crazy. And I, I was just saying my ski, I have a pair of, you know, the skis I ski every day are wider than that. So it's an incredibly small amount of additional insulation. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's kind of where I think if we go up to the idea that um, you can just add more insulation, add more windows, um, you know, kind of do it on a prescriptive way. That's not necessarily how we deal with it. Passive House is different in the sense that we're looking at how those benefit ratios work against those with each other. So there's a lot of assumptions like a I've been, I was designing some projects which I thought that maybe I need more insulation in the roof and almost it wouldn't change my energy savings at all. And sometimes if you take insulation out, you can actually improve the energy savings overall from your cooling balanced on your heating. So that's cool. not unusual. Yeah. So uh, I've got, I'm going to step back into our questions here um, and see if we can get through them. I think there's four, four or five or so left. Um, this one's from Ryan, um, and he asks, do you work with insulated concrete forms or styrocrete? I'm a foam-free guy, personally. I, I tend to take away, I, I tend not, I tend to isolate thermally my foundation systems. Um, but uh, ICFs are really excellent when you have complicated wood sites um, or you need to save space or these other constraints. So uh, I, I do believe our Denver project is going to have an ICF uh, stem wall foundation. So um, yeah, just you know, using the right product in the right place definitely makes sense. Uh, once you get to the wall systems, uh, a concrete a concrete styrofoam wall um, is is from the carbon point point of view is not great, but for a foundation point of view, it does seem to make quite a bit of sense. So definitely. Definitely want to be open to all the different types of systems, but use the ones that are the best applicable for the certain components of the building. This is kind of my personal point of view. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, next question is from Martin. Is the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, interested in using passive houses for building projects? And the second part is what's happening on the federal level with that? That's a good question. And um, now the Canadians, their, their HUD, their version of HUD has been responsive to Passive House Canada. And Passive House Canada is doing quite a bit of in, in working with the, on a national scale. Um, there is, the Department of Energy doesn't really have much influence and, and honestly, they don't have that much building science right now. So the way the United States tends to be is more kind of district oriented, uh, kind of in how they're implementing it on the national scale. Um, you know, wouldn't we like to hang out with Buttigieg for 
it's, it's not Pete, he's transportation. I don't know who's head of HUD, but um, it'd be, it'd be Hey Andrew, I think we're uh, I think we're losing you again. Are you there? Large scale housing projects, um, but it is definitely um, hard to kind of when Pasadena is still incredibly tiny. It's not even really on the radar uh, at that scale, unfortunately, in the United States. Okay, yeah, I think we we had a a little bit of a blurb. Um, cut out of your audio there, um, but I think you I think you hit the gist of it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next question from L Sanders: Do you do you anticipate retrofits using Larson trusses or other techniques being financially viable? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think um, Larson trusses are brilliant uh, it doesn't take that much limb lumber it's something that you can site built or built off-site really quite quickly you fill it with cellulose um, you get good continuous so so the way to do it if you have like a two by four wall basically a passive house can be a, the passive houses we're building now um, are like a two by six two by eight structural wall and then sheathing and then um, Usually that's your airtight layer two, if you have to have it as such. And then on the outside of that, you put in a Larson truss system. So essentially all houses now have the potential of being a passive house simply by putting on, building out that exterior. There's all sorts of other complications, of course, but um, yeah, it's totally viable. Great. I think that was, uh, I think that was the last of the questions that we had. Uh, come in from our audience this was really informative for me um, and i'm sure for our audience as well um, to get to learn more about passive houses and and what you've been working on for the last several years and and more um, so thank you very much for spending the time uh to be with us this evening yeah yeah you bet and i just kind of like a shout out to show you something to look forward to is uh, uh the company alpin glass uh, who's based near Boulder, I think there's Louisville maybe, their new plant. Uh, they just came out with a quad pane, uh, thin glass um, product that they can use with fiberglass, their fiberglass frames, which we can use for passive house for, because, for multifamilies because of the, because of the um, fire issues. Um, it looks like even, you know, we still have a lot of new components that are coming to the market and it makes it quite easier every day uh, to make these things quite viable. So, so it's lots of breaking news all the time in this, in this particular field. Yeah, and there's certainly an innovator, um, um, you know, within our local community and doing some really impressive work with glass. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, great. Right Excellent. On. Let's talk pass it else again sometime. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation this evening. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, again, if uh, if folks would like to see this presentation at a later point in time or pass it on, you can go to the crest-energy.org website and look up our videos um, and we will have it posted in approximately a week. Thank you so much, Andrew, again, for your time this evening. Very informative and we look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. Great, thank you, thank you. Thank you.